Hello, I'm Carrie Bailey. I'm the Tweet Librarian at the Arlington Heights Memorial Library. Welcome to our virtual program, Beyond Birds and Bees, with Dr. Heidi Crowett. It's so great to have you all here. I might be recognizing a couple names if people have joined the last couple weeks. It's so uh, great to have you back. And for those of you that have not been a part of this series yet, welcome. We are, I think, all together in for a treat tonight. We're going to really get into some good conversation on how we can help support our kids in this sort of preteen middle, uh, middle school age group on how to raise sexually healthy kids and support them as they start to navigate this world of puberty and relationships and their exposure to uh, sexualized images on the internet. And we just have so much that we get to talk about tonight. As you've already heard, if you have questions, you can feel free to type them in at any time. I'll be kind of monitoring that chat box throughout, but then we will have plenty of time at the end for questions. I wanna start by just sharing a little bit of information about myself and giving you a little bit of background on who I am and kind of the approach that I take to these conversations. So I have this program beyond birds and bees. It is my favorite thing that I get to do. My day job is that I'm a professor. And so the academic research that I've been doing for almost 20 years now has been really trying to understand how families communicate about sex. And so Beyond Birds and Bees came from all of that research I've been doing. And like I said, it's my favorite part of my job, spending time with parents who are really just trying to figure out how to do the best they can. And for a lot of us, we don't always feel like we have the support around us. We didn't learn a lot from our parents growing up. There's a lot of confusing messages that we were sent as we were going through adolescence. And I think for a lot of us, we wanna do more and we wanna do better for our kids. And I always say that that is not our parents' fault. It's not that they did anything wrong. They also didn't know any better, right? We've had generations of families who just really are not educated on how to talk about sex. And so you all are here because you know that it's going to take some time and effort to really learn how we can successfully navigate these conversations. So I applaud you for being a part of this virtual series. I think it's so important and I'm really looking forward to sharing the research with you. You're going to hear me say a couple of phrases over and over tonight. And so I wanna make sure that you really understand what they mean and that we're all together in that language and we know what we're talking about. I've already said it once, but I think that our shared goal is to raise sexually healthy kids. And I think for a lot of parents, we have a goal of talking to our kids about sex, right? That you probably even joined this session thinking, I'm gonna learn how to talk to my kid about sex. And I promise we will get to that tonight and we will specifically say how we can talk to them about sexual behavior and sexual intercourse. But raising sexually healthy kids is actually what I think most of us are aiming for. That it's not just our goal to talk to them about sex one time and leave it there, but rather we're trying to raise sexually healthy kids who grow up to be sexually healthy teenagers, who grow up to be sexually healthy adults. I think it's fair to say that all of us in this room want our kids to grow up to be adults who feel confident, and comfortable in their sexual relationships, that they feel really good about the sexual decisions that they've made, and they feel really safe in their relationships. That's fair, right? That's something that we all want, but that's not just going to happen overnight. And we know it doesn't happen overnight because we know for a lot of us, it didn't happen overnight. So raising those kids who become these sexually healthy adults, it really starts now. It starts now when we think about raising them as their young children and growing into this pre-puberty, puberty age group. Tonight, we're going to be focusing most of our attention on that fourth through sixth grade age group, although a lot of what we'll share will kind of come a little bit from that younger age group and then bleed into that older age group as well. But we're really going to try and focus our time and effort on those fourth through sixth graders tonight. And this is a big age group. Terry and I were just talking before you all joined that you know, the difference between a fourth grader and a sixth grader is pretty big, but we are going to do our best to cover all of that tonight. This is a big age group for a lot of reasons, and I'm going to share a lot of the research with you on why this is such a big age group, but a lot of it just happens to be because not only are they going through puberty or about to, but their exposure to the world has changed at this age. 
our kids who once used to just want to sit on our laps all the time and snuggle all day, that we could drive them to their activities and they wanted us to stay and cheer them on. A lot of those kids are now becoming these preteens who maybe want nothing to do with us, or maybe they're just asking for more independence. Maybe they're asking for a phone, they have a phone, they're certainly with other people who have phones. Their exposure to not only technology and the internet, but their exposure to how other people live their lives is so much more now than it ever has been before. That's one of the things that makes this such a, I think, difficult age group, not only as parents, but for them as kids. And that plays a role in how we can help raise them to be sexually healthy. So we're going to try to talk about all of that tonight as well. I also want to share with you that I personally have a fourth grader and a seventh grader. So I feel like I am in this with you. This is not just me sharing all of my professional expertise, but I also will be sharing tonight stories about my own family and my own experiences, really trying to put this research into action. I am in it with you. Okay, so let's go back to raising sexually healthy kids. I think that's our collective goal, and I want us to start thinking about it that way. That rather than just thinking about what are the words that I should use to talk to my kids about sex, what are the sexual topics that they should know or not know at this age, we really want to think of kind of this bigger picture, this broader idea of raising them to be sexually healthy. Okay, so what does that really mean? Well, here's a couple things that we think of when we think about what it means to be sexually healthy. Sexually healthy kids, first and foremost, they know and understand their bodies. This means that they know what their bodies are for and what they're not for. They know what the purpose of their body parts are and they understand how their body works. This is uh, maybe an easier one when they're younger. I know it's difficult to start using proper names and labels if we've never done that before, but by the time our kids are in this age group that we're talking about tonight, it's more than just proper names and labels for their body parts. It's starting to help them really know and understand what is happening to their body in these next few years. And that is a lot. That can feel intimidating because as our hope is that they grow up to be these sexually healthy adults, I know that not all of us as sexually healthy adults in this room feel very confident explaining what happens during puberty. And not all of us feel very confident explaining uh, what exactly is going on with our bodies at every any single moment. So sexually healthy kids know and understand their bodies. A big part of what we can do at this age is help them understand what their body is for and not for and what's going on. Sexually healthy kids can also appreciate their bodies. This means that more than just understanding what their bodies are doing and why their bodies are doing it, that we're trying to raise kids who can appreciate what their bodies are doing and the body that they are living in. This is big for many reasons. One, we want our kids to have some kind of a positive association with their bodies. We want them to feel good in their skin because that's a part of their self-esteem and a part of their identity. But we also want them to appreciate what their bodies are doing because as they get older and they start to really question how their body feels and what it's doing and why is it doing what it's doing and I don't like it, we also want them to appreciate that it's part of kind of a bigger picture for their bodies. That the process of puberty, for example, right, is the process of our body changing from kind of being a child to being an adult. And while I know if we all remember puberty, right, it can feel yucky at times. It is not the time that we all feel the best about ourselves. But it is pretty cool what's happening with our bodies. And it's part of this plan, right, it's part of our body's development as we get older to create us to be these adults who hopefully can be sexually healthy adults. So when we talk to our kids about their bodies or about our bodies, we really want to be thinking about talking about our bodies with a positive association. And I mentioned how we talk about our bodies because that's a really big part of our job as parents in raising sexually healthy kids, that we are at this age leading by example. When our kids were younger, right, we could really tell them things and certainly they didn't always listen to us, right? That they start rolling their eyes at us when they're pretty young or they're tuning out or they're distracted. But for the most part, if we tell them what something is for or what it does, they will listen. At this age, kids have already started to develop that sense of insecurity about their bodies. A lot of kids have already developed kind of an embarrassment or even a sense of shame about their bodies. 
And that is not our fault solely as parents, right? That is the world that we live in. We live in a world that really is hyper-focused on what people look like. And we see a lot of images of bodies in the world and there's not a lot of diversity in those bodies. And we know that that's been going on for decades. But kids are really attuned to that. They pick up on that and they internalize what those images are and whether or not they look similar to those images. They can internalize how other people are talking about their bodies and they can internalize what their friends are saying about their bodies. So it's not just us, but as their parents, we have a really important responsibility and I think a really important opportunity to be role models in how we talk about appreciating our own bodies. This is something that we can start to do in a couple different ways. So one is just, we've got to cut out the negative self-talk, right? We've got to cut out the kind of looking in the mirror and asking, how does this make me look? Does this make me look fat? Or I don't feel good in these clothes, or I don't like this. This color doesn't look good on me. The cut of these pants isn't great. Even when we joke about all of these kind of trends that are coming up these days, and we can joke about mom jeans coming back and how nobody wants that, right? We can joke about all of these things, but somewhere in there is usually some kind of a, a knock or a negative connotation about our bodies. And our kids pick up on that. They pick up on the fact that if we are hyper-focused about our bodies, that they should be hyper-focused about their bodies. So first we cut out our own negative self-talk. But the second thing that we can do to take it a step further when it comes to the appreciating our bodies and the sex, raising sexually healthy kids is that we can go so far as to purposefully talk about our bodies in positive ways, that we can talk about how we appreciate our bodies, even if we don't always feel like it. For example, right? If it's a beautiful day, right? And as these spring days come up and we get some of this beautiful weather, we can go for a walk outside. And after we get back from that walk, we can say, wow, I feel so lucky that my body is able to take that walk. Oh, that felt good. Something as simple as that, right? I'm sure that when we take those walks and we say, oh, what a beautiful night. I'm so, I'm so thankful that the sun is finally shining. We can just add one more comment to it. I'm so thankful that my body can do that, right? Or when, if you're exercising, if you are somebody who works out or you go for runs or you go to the gym, instead of focusing on maybe going to the gym or going for a run because of how it makes you look, we can go out of our way to talk about how we feel after we do that. And I'm guessing that a lot of us aren't going around saying, I've got to get to the gym because I've got to lose weight, right? But our kids can internalize that that is a message. That is a reason why some people do go to the gym. And so what we can do is just start to say, I feel so strong after I go there. It feels so good to go and lift weights. I'm so thankful my body lets me do that. Just starting to show appreciation for the function of our body, not for what our body looks like, but for what our bodies can do. Because part of raising sexually healthy kids is raising a generation of kids who look at their bodies for more than just uh, what their bodies look like and how other people see their bodies especially young girls. And I think about the moms in this room and I think about the women and I think about how a lot of us were raised. We very much were aware that our bodies, right? were being looked at by other people. And a lot of us felt like that was one of the sole purposes of our body was for other people to look at. As parents, we don't want our kids to believe that. We want our kids to know that their bodies are bigger than that, right? They're for more than just other people. In fact, they're not for other people. So how do we do that? It's by starting to talk about our own bodies in those ways. So sexually healthy kids, they know their bodies, they understand their bodies, they appreciate their bodies. Sexually healthy kids can also show love and intimacy in a variety of ways. This is a really important one, again, at this age group. When I talk to parents of younger kids, when I talk about how we want our kids to be able to show love and intimacy in a variety of ways, what we're talking about is showing them that there's a lot of ways that you can show love to your friends and your family members. As sexually healthy adults, this one we're all pretty good at. You all know that you show love differently to your spouse than you do your best friend, than you do your children, than you do your parents. You can love all of those people. You can be affectionate with all of those people, but you show that love and you are intimate with them in different ways. The group that really struggles with this are those teenagers. And so tonight when we're talking about kind of our preteens, we wanna think about setting them up for success. 
to understand that there are a lot of ways that they can show love and they can be intimate. They're heading into some pretty formative years here where they're starting to look up to the older people in their life, right? Not us as often as we'd like. It's usually the older teenagers in their life, whether it's siblings or cousins or people that they see at school or athletes that they're around or uh, you know influencers that they might see. But they're really looking to them to see what are they doing? What's cool? What should I be doing? What's expected at these different age groups? And what we all know is that many teenagers are not telling the truth about their sexual behavior, their experiences, and the ways that they show love or are intimate with their romantic partners. There's a lot of um, not only exaggeration, but there's just a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of lack of information. And so our kids are left kind of filling in the blanks and just going off of rumors or going off of maybe some of that exaggeration or misinformation. And so our kids grow up thinking that there's just a couple ways that if you're in a romantic relationship, you might show somebody love or be intimate. I know for a lot of us in this room now, if you think back to being a teenager yourself, we grew up with like this myth, right? That there was only a couple ways to show love or to be intimate in romantic relationships. You looked at your friends or you heard what your friends were telling you about the types of behaviors they were engaging in. And you felt like, oh, okay, I guess this is what people do. I guess maybe we start by holding hands. Maybe they put their arm around me. Maybe we're kissing, maybe we're making out. Maybe it's going beyond that. And at some point, right, you see this progression of physical behavior and intimacy, and it just doesn't seem like there's a lot of variety or a lot of options. And in fact, this has always kind of baffled me. And the more I think about it as a parent, the more I think, wow, we really got to change this. But I think for a lot of us, we grew up with like, you maybe set a boundary here, like this is a physical boundary and I'm not gonna surpass that with a romantic partner, right? Maybe it was making out, maybe it was um, you know, touching, maybe it was oral sex, maybe it was sexual intercourse, whatever it was that you had a boundary and you said, I'm not passing that line. Well, lo and behold, perhaps you passed that line. And a lot of us grew up in a world that it was like all of a sudden that boundary then disappears and this is your new boundary. And then if you pass this new boundary, it disappears. And it was like, we just kept pushing it farther rather than saying, this is my boundary. If I go beyond it, guess what? I can go back and say, I don't want to do that anymore. I can still hold firm that this is my boundary. Even if I pass that boundary one day in one relationship, I can tell that partner or my next partner, I don't want to do that anymore. Most of us were not raised or equipped with the tools to be able to do that. A lot of us didn't know that we had those options. A lot of us certainly didn't know how to communicate that to a partner to say, I really love you and I care about you. And I still want to stay in this romantic relationship with you, but I don't want to do that behavior anymore. So for most of us in this room, if we've got fourth through sixth graders, they're not in that point of those boundaries setting, right? They're not in that point of crossing those boundaries. But when we're thinking about raising sexually healthy kids, we have to start talking to our kids now about how to set boundaries, how to hold boundaries, how to communicate about boundaries. And we have to start showing them that there are a lot of ways that you can be affectionate and show love and intimacy in your relationships. Some of that can start with how we show love and intimacy in our relationships, right? We can start to show a variety of those things in our own home, right? We can also start to just call attention to it when we see it in a movie. Maybe we see somebody going up and rubbing someone's back and we say, oh, what a really special way to show that person that they love them. Or we might say, um, wow, it felt like that person felt pressured to engage in that sexual behavior. I wish they knew that they had options, right? And so we can just start to say these things to our kids. And in this age group, they're ready for us to start making some of those things come from kind of behind the scenes to coming really in the forefront of our conversations. So, so far we've talked about sexually healthy kids, knowing and understanding their bodies, appreciating their bodies, expressing love and intimacy in a variety of ways. The last point I wanna to touch on when it comes to raising sexually healthy kids is that sexually healthy kids grow up to be sexually healthy teenagers and sexually healthy adults who are effective decision makers. This means that sexually healthy kids can practice that 
uh, that decision making. This is really just essentially decision making is kind of like critical thinking. But this is us trying to raise a generation of kids who can think before they act, right? Raising a generation of kids who know in order to make a decision, what questions do they need to ask? What information do they need to know? We know that kids are far more likely to follow through with a decision if it is their decision. If it is our decision, we don't want you hanging out with these people. I don't want you looking at these websites. I don't want you going to these parties where people are drinking. I don't want you engaging in sexual behaviors. That might get us like another year or two, but then they're on their own, right? We're not with them at all of those parties. We're not with them when they're with these friends of theirs. We're not with them in their devices all the time. So we can't just assume or even trust that if we say, don't do this, that they'll say, okay, I won't do that because my mom told me not to. We know that's not what's gonna happen when they're 14, 15, 18. What we want is for kids to be in those moments and for them to say, I'm not doing this because I don't want to. I made the choice not to drink at this party. I made the choice not to look at these websites. I made the choice not to follow what my friends were doing or I made the choice not to engage in these sexual behaviors. They're far more likely to follow through with that decision if it is their decision, but they need to know how to make decisions. This means that what we can start to do now is give our kids a lot of opportunities to practice that decision-making. And I always say that, listen, as a parent of a fourth grader and a seventh grader, I know we are busy and most of the time it is just easier if I make the decisions. Right. If me or my partner say, this is where we're going, this is what we're doing, this is the camp we're signing you up for, even so much that with my 13 year old, I will still pick out many of his outfits. It is just easier. This is what you're wearing. Right. We get up in the morning. He's our first one that has to get out the door. None of us are early risers. So we give ourselves 13 minutes in the morning to get up, get ready for school, and get out the door. That is not a joke. That is my daily life right now. And in those 13 minutes, I do not have time for his sleepy head to be deciding what to wear. So usually I'm like, here you go, clothes on the floor, get dressed, let's go. And every time I do it, I think, what am I doing, right? These are little opportunities for him to practice that effective decision-making. So what if he shows up to school in shorts and a t-shirt and it is going to be 40 degrees again, right? He will learn. So what if he shows up to school and his outfit doesn't match and he realizes it in the middle of the day, right? Even if somebody comments to him about it, he will learn from those experiences. We want to give our children those low risk opportunities to practice effective decision-making so that they can think through decisions as they get older. So this means when we're thinking about a low risk decision, we're thinking about something that is unlikely to really like change the you know kind of course of their life. So it's something like what they want to wear or what activity they want to be a part of or what they want to eat or where they want to go and hang out over the weekend, things like that, that we can say, okay, well, I want you to think about what decision you want to make. Maybe we even say, let me know how you come to that decision. Talk me through your process. They come and say, uh, this is what I want to do tonight. Okay, well, how did you get to that? What are you thinking about, right? And just starting to get them to talk through their process. And again, having kids in this age group, I know that they're not always like, oh, mom, I just can't wait to talk to you about everything and tell you all of my things that I'm thinking about. I know most of the kids are like, I don't know how I got to this decision. I just decided I wanted to do it. That's where, again, our modeling comes in. That when we are thinking about, should I wear a jacket today? What type of shoes should I wear today? When we are thinking about what we are going to put in our bodies for food, that maybe we start to think out loud a little bit, right? Like maybe we say, oh, today it's gonna to be a little bit colder than yesterday. I probably should bring a jacket just in case. Something as simple as that. We're starting to model for our kids, what are the things that we should be thinking about in order to make decisions? What we're hoping for is that by the time our kids become those adolescents, those real teenagers, that they are equipped with the critical thinking skills that are required to make good and healthy decisions that they know what information do I need in order to make the decision? What decision am I gonna make? And then how do I follow through on that decision? So maybe we have an example where um, our child doesn't wanna hang out with this one friend anymore. 
or they were invited to two different places at the same time and they have to tell one of their friends that they don't wanna hang out there. That's a really tough situation to be in when you're 12 years old. That's really tough because letting your friends down can be painful. It can be, you can think that it's going to be the end of the world. And sometimes it feels like the end of the world if our friend isn't supportive of those decisions, right? So then we help our kids think about, okay, well, what decision are you gonna make? How did you come to that decision? And now let's talk about how are you going to communicate that decision? How are you going to tell your friend that you have different plans this weekend? And it can't just be us always telling the parents, oh, they're busy. It can't just be us telling our kids to just lie and say, tell them that we're going out of town. We know that as adults, that's not realistic. As adults, we constantly have to make those kinds of decisions. We wanna teach our kids how to make those decisions now so it comes more naturally as they get older. All right, now you might be thinking, okay, uh, Heidi, you've been talking for like 30 minutes and none of this has to do with sex. Okay, it does have to do with sex though. It has everything to do with raising sexually healthy kids. And here's the thing. If we think that talking to our kids about sex is just about sex, then we are teaching our kids that sex is just sex. And I think for most of us, we believe that sex is more than just this physical thing that they should or should not do. Most of us want to teach our kids that sex is personal, it's emotional, yes, it's physical, but it's also relational. And so when we think about that big picture of what do I want my kids to understand about sex and sexual behavior and sexuality and sexual identity, what do I want them to think about? Well, I want them to think about all of these things. So that means that we have to be equipped to talk about all of these things. We have to understand that the connection between body image and self-esteem is directly related to their beliefs and their experiences with sexuality. We have to believe that the relationship that they have with their peers, the way that they look to their peers for guidance or approval has a direct impact on how they might look to their romantic partners or their peers in the future for guidance or approval. When we think about raising sexually healthy kids, we first and foremost want to think it is a much bigger picture than just telling our kids what sex is. My big mission that I want parents to really think about is that you are already doing so much of this good and important work. A lot of the examples that I've given so far, you might be thinking, oh, I do that. I do that really, I do that a lot. I just did that today. That's great. I want you to feel like you can pat yourself on the back and say, I'm already doing some of the things necessary to raise sexually healthy kids. Because then when it comes time to actually talking to them about the more sexual part of raising sexually healthy kids, we can feel like we've already done some of the other things. And for those of you that have never talked to your kids about sex, you've never told them what it is. Maybe you've never even talked to them about puberty. We're going to talk about that tonight. So we're going to get there and say, well, what do we say? And how do we say it? And when do we say these things? But I want you to think about what are the other things that you're doing in, in relationship to raising these sexually healthy kids? Because that is important too. All right, so now that we have our head wrapped around this idea of raising sexually healthy kids, I want to talk about developmentally our kids in this age group. What are they ready to hear? What should they know? And how do we start to talk to them about these things? So if you've been to some of our previous sessions in this virtual series, you know that I use this research by a woman named Dr. Ann Bernstein. She came up with these categories and these categories really help us understand developmentally where our kids are at. And I think for us as parents, they're just really helpful kind of names, categories to help us remember what our kids are really thinking at these ages. So when I was talking with those parents of really young kids, I said, well, those young kids, those toddlers and preschoolers, we call them geographers, right? Because they like to know where things are and what they're called. So when we're raising sexually healthy geographers, we're talking to them about proper names and labels, helping them understand what their bodies are. Then when I was talking with parents of first through third graders, we talked about those kids being labeled as manufacturers because manufacturers are no longer satisfied with just names and labels. They wanna know how it all works. So that means when I talk to parents of first through third graders, I'm telling them 
that if their kids are asking questions about how babies are made, how, where babies came from, sexual behaviors, they're ready to know because developmentally their brains are wanting to know how does this work? So with our geographers, we can do things like label a sperm and an egg. With our manufacturers, we might answer the question, how did the sperm and egg meet? Our kids that we're focusing on tonight, those fourth through sixth graders, we call them reporters, reporters. Because our kids are not just satisfied with how things work, they now want to know everything. They wanna know the who, what, when, where, and why of everything. And here's the tricky part that you all as parents of this age group understand. They're not always coming to us to answer the who, what, when, where, and why. They think that they know it all themselves or that they are going to get that information themselves. That's the really tricky part about raising reporters is that we need to understand that developmentally, their brains are looking for the details. They wanna know all of these things. They have tons of questions. They're just not always asking us. So we have to then find that balance between not lecturing them about everything, but giving them a lot of information. So I wanna to talk tonight about how, we're, how can we do that when it comes to some of these sexual topics? How can we balance not sitting them down and lecturing them about everything, but making sure that we answer their questions or that we can initiate conversations that will answer the questions that they likely have. So here's the thing with our reporters. So if you heard me say that manufacturers are ready to know how it works, and so for manufacturers, we might have had conversations with how sperm and egg meet. So when we're talking about explaining how babies are made, or when we're talking about what sexual intercourse is, we can tell our manufacturers the whole sperm and egg story and how they meet. If you're in this room with us tonight and you're thinking, Heidi, I have a reporter and I have not told my reporter that, that's okay. Yes, the older they get, the more likely they are to have heard these things from other places, whether it's their peers or at school or they found it on the internet. They are more likely to know these things even if we haven't shared with them because they have access to more information the older they get. But you still have a really great opportunity to circle back with your kids and tell them this according to your own beliefs, your own values, and just using your information from your mouth. We want our kids, even if we think, yes, I know that they already know this because they had that talk at school, Heidi, I told them all about it. Okay, well, first of all, I'll tell you that if they had that talk at school, find out what kind of a talk they had. What did they really learn? Because a lot of times what they're learning at school is vocabulary and it's important vocabulary and a lot of it relates to puberty and that's great for our pre-puberty kids or our puberty kids to know, but they're not usually learning a lot about sexual intercourse or sexual behavior at this age. Maybe some of your kids are at schools that are sharing more of that, but it's unlikely. So if you don't know what the schools are sharing, you have every right to ask. You have every right to email their teacher or the principal and say, hey, I'm wondering what they did. I know you said that they were learning this health unit. In fact, my own fourth grader, I just got an email last week that they are covering this new health unit. It's going to be at the end of May. And they gave us kind of the standards that they need to meet at the end of that health unit. And so I got to see all the vocabulary that they're learning and I got to see what the kind of main message will be. And at this age in fourth grade, it wasn't much. And in my school district in fourth grade, they separate the kids, male and female, and they really only learn mostly about their own bodies at that age. And then the following year, they might be learning more about the opposite um, sex. So again, look into what your kids have learned at school. But even if they have learned things at school or you know that somebody else had a talk with them about this or you know that they read a book about it, it is so important for our kids to hear these words come out of our mouths. If we wanna raise sexually healthy kids who will talk to us about the decisions they're making as they get older, about the situations that they're in, the experiences that they're considering, if we want them to talk to us about their friendships, their romantic partners, their bodies even, they have to trust that we are capable of talking about it. And if we've never talked about it, if we've never said these words with our kids, they are not going to come and talk to us about it when they're 13, 15, or 18. 
The time is now. We are still in a really great age where while they are starting to exert their independence and they aren't quite as maybe close and snuggly with us as they used to be, we still do have a pretty good ear open with them, right? That we say things and we know they're listening, even if it's just with one ear. So let's use this time frame as our opportunity to let our kids hear us use the terminology for body parts, for puberty, for sexual intercourse or sexual behaviors. So you might consider this. If you're somebody in this room and you're thinking, oh, I have not said anything about this to my kids. Blame me, use me, use this session and say, hey, you know how I was on that virtual meeting the other day and I was listening to this lady talk about just like how smart you are. And she was reminding me that at your age, you just know so many things and it made me realize that like, there's a lot I haven't talked to you about that I really wanted to talk to you about. I'm sorry if you've had questions about your body or puberty or about sexual intercourse or sexual behaviors. I'm sorry if we've never talked about it. I didn't really know when or how to bring it up, but I think it's important that you hear it from me. Okay, so we're gonna start by just saying, it's okay to acknowledge that maybe we should have done more or that we wanted to do more and we didn't know how, that's okay. Then we're going to give our kids a little bit of time to think about a conversation that we might have. So we're going to say, so you know what? So next week, I want to take you out for a smoothie and I want to have a little chat with you. And I'm going to ask, ask you some questions and I'm going to share with you some things that I want you to know. And if you have questions, you can ask me, but we'll just go out for a smoothie. So you give them maybe a week notice, right? And then maybe you give them a day notice right before you say, hey, tomorrow, tomorrow's the day I want to take you out for a smoothie. Let's go have that chat. They might still roll their eyes at you. They might still seem uninterested, but we've given them advance notice because we don't wanna trap them. We don't wanna make our kids feel trapped in a conversation. The other thing that we're trying to do, the reason I suggest going and doing this with like an activity, getting a smoothie or going out for ice cream or I'm going for a walk or maybe playing a quick game of basketball. I suggest wrapping this around an activity because it gives you a time constraint. This says that when you are done with your smoothie, we are done with the conversation. We don't go order that second smoothie because we wanna keep talking, right? I'm not going to lecture my child for 30 minutes, 45 minutes or an hour if we've never talked about this stuff before. And by the way, even if we have, that's too long to be ever having these kind of big intense conversations unless it is being led by our child. Our kids these days, we all know this, they don't have long attention spans, right? They are so used to quickly getting information. They have a question, they can look it up. They see something, they scroll right past it. As adults, we're getting to be that way too, right? But that means that we're not just gonna sit and listen to our parents talk to us for 30 minutes about something that makes us super uncomfortable. So we don't wanna put our kids in that position. We wanna put our kids in a position where they can trust that we have some information to share. We're going to share real, accurate, honest information with them, and then we are done. So my advice is that if you have not told your children yet about sexual intercourse, if they have not heard you describe how babies are made, that that be the first conversation that you have. Give them a week, take them out for their smoothie or for their walk, tell them that it might only take three minutes, that's okay, right? You sit down with your smoothie, you ask how their day was, you remind them what conversation you wanted to have, you quickly tell them about it. And I can give you some exact scripts later if that's something that you're looking for but then we can wrap it up and talk more about our day and be done. The idea is that we are doing relationship building while doing some information sharing. At this age, we wanna build trust with our kids. We want them to trust us that we will not only give them accurate information, but we, they can trust that we are going to keep it short. We are not going to burden them with a long lecture every time they have a question. The hope is that our kids start to trust that if they did have a question about their bodies or something they heard about at school or something they saw on the internet, that they could come and say to us, hey, dad, I have a question. What's this mean? Or, hey, I saw this thing. What is that? That we would answer it and that we would be done. That's what we're hoping for. Now, at this age, our kids, we might be tempted to be like, but Heidi, there's so much to say if I tell them about babies and I got to talk to them about all of these other things. And then I got to talk to them about like, well, I don't think that they should be having sexual intercourse. And this is who I think should be having sexual intercourse. And then I got to tell them about protection and consent and diseases. And I got to tell them about pregnancy. Okay. 
if you are like me, I'm overwhelmed just saying all of those words to you. You are likely overwhelmed hearing all of them. Imagine now being 11 years old and hearing your parent go through all of that. It's too much. One thing at a time. When we think about our reporters' brains and the way they're working, we think about they want the who, what, when, where, and why, right? That means that we're giving them just kind of that basic information for now. They ask us a question, we give them the answer that is directly to their question. If they have another question, we can answer that directly. We will have more opportunities to talk with our kids. As they get older, we will have more opportunities to say, hey, I know that I've told you a little bit about sexual intercourse, and I know I've told you about you know, kind of when that we don't think that it's something that teenagers should be doing, but I feel like it's something that we should talk about. And I wanted to let you know in our family, what we believe about when we think sexual behaviors are appropriate. That's something that you can then come to when they're older, right? And not because they don't need to know right now, if they're asking those questions, you can answer them. But because our primary goal is to do that relationship building and the information sharing. The relationship building piece is so key at this age because we're trying to set the framework or the foundation for them to come to us when they're older. And that's not going to happen if they think we're going to lecture them or if we think we're not going to give them accurate information. If we stumble over everything that we're gonna say, if we always tell them, this isn't the time, don't ask now, where did you hear that? I'm gonna call their mother. If that's how we respond to all of the things that they're asking us or that they're saying or that we're seeing, they are going to shut down and not come to us. Kids respond to how adults say things just as much as they respond to what is being said. They are looking for our reactions and they are looking for how we are saying things, not just what we are saying. So if we panic every time they come to us and we say, you shouldn't know that. I don't know why you're asking me that question. You shouldn't know that. Who told you that? That reaction to them is going to stand out way more than just the information that we give them. All right, so we've talked about if you have not started with that basic like what is sexual intercourse thing, that's where we start. The next thing that we can do, again, a separate conversation would be to make sure that our kids understand puberty, right? That if we have not talked, again, from our mouths to their ears, if we have not talked to them about puberty, we wanna start doing that as soon as we can. We know that for puberty, um, it starts earlier for girls than it does for boys. And we know that for a lot of girls, that's going to start in about that fourth grade year. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting their periods, but puberty starts before that. For girls, we typically think of their first signs of puberty as getting breast buds, right? We consider that if once they get kind of a breast bud, if you will, that it's about maybe a year and a half, two years before we could expect their period. That's not exact science. That's just kind of a trend or an average. Once they get breast buds, then they will get breast mounds. I did not come up with these words, by the way. This is what they're called. But those breast mounds is when the breast tissue itself starts to get a little bit bigger. And once we start to see that they have these breast mounds, which I hate just keep saying that word, right? We can then think that that period is likely coming soon, right? Now that again is not our perfect science. We want to equip our young girls, even in fourth grade, with what a period is, what they can expect, how to take care of the, uh, a period. We want them to be equipped with maybe having tampons with them. We want them to know who they should talk to or what they should say about it. We want them to hear that from us so that we know that they would maybe trust coming to us when they do get that first period. Now, boys usually don't start puberty until a little bit older, although we typically just don't see those signs, but inside their bodies, a lot is happening, right? Those hormones are starting to change even in this fourth grade year, even if we don't necessarily see it until more of that like fifth, sixth or seventh grade year, right? And then it's usually that like eighth grade year where we look around and we think, well, where did this person come from? Because we see that big difference, but that is all starting when they're younger. And here's the thing. First, we wanna make sure that our kids understand what's going to happen to their own bodies. That is important. It's important that they understand it, that we frame it positively. This doesn't mean by the way that we have to say, oh my gosh, I'm just so excited for you to get your period. It's gonna be wonderful, right? I'm not right naive enough to think that we're gonna raise our girls to think that it's beautiful every single time. But what we can do is tell our kids that when I was your age, I remember not always feeling very confident with my body. And I want you to have more information than I have so that you can be more confident. Or we might say, 
I know that sometimes when you do get your period, you might not always feel the best, but it's also kind of like a really cool thing that's happening with your body. And I want you to understand what is happening with your body when that happens and why it's happening. Because if we've told them then about reproduction, if they know kind of how babies are made, regardless of whether they are going to have babies that way when they're older, doesn't matter at this point, but it helps explain like why our body is doing what it's doing. Why is it making this transition? What is the purpose of a period? Right? It's hard to explain. It's the shedding of the lining and there's the, right, we're ovulating if they don't even know what that purpose is. So that's why I say start the reproduction piece, start with how babies are made, right? And then we can talk about what changes are experienced, being experienced during puberty. Once we've shared with them what's going to happen with their own bodies, we can start to share with them what will happen with the other uh, sex body. Now, this is particularly uh, good. Well, I won't, it's not particularly good for either one. This is good for both boys and girls. Because even if you're thinking, well, I have a son, so he's 10. He doesn't really need to know much now. I'll wait till he's like 11 or 12. Okay, but your son is likely around a lot of girls and those girls are going through puberty. So we don't want to raise boys who are looking at girls going, oh, what's that on your pants? You've got blood everywhere. Or, oh, what do I see? Is that a bra? Or they're flicking bra straps or they're making fun of girls if they're not wearing a bra or if they can see the bra. We do not want to raise a generation of boys, right, who grow up with that behavior. I have to tell you a story. I share it with every group that I talk to at this age. But I was doing a speaking event. This was maybe a couple of years ago now. And it was this big event. There were all these parents there. And I was talking. And these two women, they were right in the front row. They raised their hand and they were like, we have to tell you a story. And I was like, okay, great, share. And this mom, she like took the other mom's hand and she said, I have to tell you a story about what my friend's son did for my daughter. And she explained that when her daughter was in fifth grade, she got her period for the first time at school unexpectedly, which is usually how it happens. It's unexpected, right? And the girl got some blood on her pants and the boy saw that she had some blood on her pants. Rather than making fun of her, rather than going and whispering about it with all of the other kids in class, he went up to her and he offered her his hoodie to tie around her waist. I still, I get every time I talk about it, I get goosebumps because, and this, by the way, these moms are like crying and then the whole audience, everyone's feeling really touched by this example because what we saw in that moment was a young boy who could have easily taken a different path and had a different reaction to what was happening to that girl. That girl was already having a day that maybe wasn't going so great, a day that she was maybe gonna remember as being embarrassed or insecure, but instead part of that day, part of her memory of her first period is going to be the kindness that somebody else showed her. That's the kind of boys that we want to be raising. And by the way, the other mom was like, he did that because we had just talked about periods. She's like, I just told him what it was though. So he knew what it was, but he knew what it was. And he knew that that wasn't something to make fun of because by the way, his body is going to do some things too. And he doesn't want people making fun of what's happening with his body. The more information we can give our kids, the better. Developmentally, they are ready for it. And relationally, it is necessary for them. It is necessary for them to have this information so that they can be better humans to each other. That is just how it's going to work. All right. So we talk about reproduction, we can talk about how babies are made, we can talk about puberty with them. The other thing that I wanna really talk about just for a few minutes here, and then I'm gonna open it up to whatever questions that you have, is that it's really important for us to start talking to our kids early about their internet exposure to pornography. This is a tough thing because a lot of us are not interested in initiating that conversation with our kids. A lot of us don't want to give them the word pornography before they've heard it from somewhere else, except that in some ways we do want them to hear it from us before they hear it from other people. But we think of our kids as being very young and innocent. And so we don't want to give them this kind of information before they're ready. Here's the reality though. They're going to be exposed to this type of information, whether visually or verbally, before they should technically be ready for it. So do we want them to have that exposure from somebody else or from us? And I think most of us would prefer that it comes from us. 
So what we can start to do is start to have some conversations with our kids, just generally about the types of images that they might be seeing. Um, you might think you might be watching a show and you might say like, what do you think about how this person is dressed in that ad? It seems like it's kind of on the verge of pornography. Do you know what that word means? Or you might say, it seems like everywhere these days, it's like women are just being shown in these ways and it just doesn't feel right to me. I wanted to talk about that, right? Or you might say, um, I was hearing some stories about kids trying to do research for school projects and how they keep finding online porn because they just have such exposure to it. Has that ever happened to you? These are ways that we can start to initiate the conversations with our kids at young ages without necessarily kind of having them be afraid of what's going to be out there. It's not fun to talk about. It's not fun for me to talk about with you, but I wanna give you some information. The average boy is exposed to pornography at the age of eight. That is not by the way, like the average boy in some other land. That is like the average boy in the research that we do. Those are my kids and your kids. The average age that a boy would start searching for pornography though, is at 11 or 12. So usually at age eight, if we're talking about exposure and that's not all, that's an average, right? But we're talking about that exposure that happens when they're young, it's usually quite accidental. They often don't quite know what it was. Um, it might be that somebody had a picture. It might be that they were exposed to something on the internet. It might be that an ad popped up on their iPad, things like that. It's like accidental exposure. They start searching when they're a little bit older, but even that is pretty innocent. Here's kind of the trajectory of how that might go, right? That you might have um, a, a boy who's 11, 12 years old, and he's starting to just be curious about girls' bodies. Maybe he's starting to be curious about his own body. What is this gonna look like? How is this gonna change? What does that look like? I wanna know more. So maybe they just go to the internet and they type in like boobs, <laughs> or they type in, hot girl. Maybe they're on Instagram, right? Or they're on uh, Snapchat and they just go hot girl. Okay. And it seems innocent, but what they're going to get in return usually isn't that innocent. One research uh, study found that when boys, that the first exposure that they had to sort of what you might be considering like hardcore or heavy pornography actually usually did come from a simple search where they might go to a social media site, search for a hot girl, they see a hot girl and they click on that girl's bio and that bio takes them to her, usually what the study was looking at was their Pornhub site. Pornhub is a common pornography site. It's very easy to access. And the thing is pornography has changed, right? Since a lot of us were young, pornography has changed. It is now anonymous, affordable, and accessible. That is not how it was for a lot of us growing up. For most, some of us, right? We didn't have the internet, right? To grow up with and to have this type of exposure. But even when it did start being something that you might find on the internet, it was harder to access. You had to pay for it. You had to type in information. That is not the case now. You might not like what I'm about to say, but just try to bear with me. If you've not visited a porn site, I actually do think that you should go and see what kind of exposure your child might have on your own. I promise it's not going to ruin your devices. I promise it's not gonna shut everything down, but I actually do encourage parents to go and visit a porn site and see how easy it is for them to have exposure to images and videos. They might have unintentionally, right, landed on one of those sites but what they're going to get is so much more than they likely wanted. They wanted a picture of a hot girl. They wanted to know what a penis looks like as it gets bigger. They wanted to know what boobs look like, right? So they had kind of a curious search that resulted in something very different. When we talk with our kids about internet safety, when we talk to our kids about pornography, here's what we as parents need to remember. Their curiosity is not the problem. Their curiosity is not the problem. We had curiosity. You all were wondering about bodies and people and what did it look like? And okay, I heard about this thing called sex. What is that? We did not have the accessibility, right? The affordability or the anonymity to go and do the searches that our kids can do. We did not have the easy access that they have. And so here's what can happen too. I want us to think about this bigger picture. It's not just like the sexual images that we're worried about. It is, yes, and I get it, right? 
that while it is normal to be curious about these things, viewing pornography is not what we're saying is normal. There's a difference there, right? The curiosity is normal. The viewing of the pornography is maybe what we're saying is not normal. But it's not just the sexual images that we're like, oh, don't look at that. Here's what's happening. When our kids see that type of information, their neurons are being fired in all of these different directions, right? They are embarrassed that they found what they found. They feel a little bit of shame about what they saw. They're a little curious and want to see more. Their body might be having a physiological reaction to what they see, but they think it's bad. And so they're worried about who's around and who's going to see it. So they think it's bad, but they like it and they want more, but they know they shouldn't have more. So their brains are literally on fire. That is really traumatizing for kids, right? That's a lot for a child to go through. And so if our response to them is that if we saw that they did a search, if we walked by their computer or phone and saw this type of image or video on their screen, and our response is to shut it down and take it away and say, you're grounded and you never get this again. And we're so angry at them. We're just adding to sort of the trauma that they've already experienced. I'm not trying to minimize uh, their, what they've done or how they've gotten there. I'm not trying to minimize that you shouldn't you know, have a, a consequence for that. But I want you to think about how even one exposure can really shape their kind of like sex template. And what we want to do instead of trying to shame them and shut them down from that is try to have a conversation with them, right? That maybe we can say, hey, I saw what you were looking at on your computer. I'm guessing you have a lot of questions about that. Or, hey, what I just saw on your computer is kind of confusing. Let's talk about it. Or we can say, hey, I don't know how you ended up on that website, but I'm sure you're really curious about bodies. That's normal. But I wanna to talk to you about what pornography is and how in our family, that's not something that we want you looking at. And here's why. There are ways to have conversations with our kids around this topic that are not just shutting the screen down, taking it away and you know, never letting them have their phone back. That's not going to be the solution. Just like there are certainly things that you can do on your phone to try to prevent our kids from getting access to some of these things, but you're never going to limit that access completely, right? Even if your child does not have a phone, if you have a family computer that's out in the open, even if you think that your child never has independent access to that technology, they will be around somebody else who does. And so what we wanna do is make sure that we're equipping our children with the sort of, again, critical thinking skills for what to do in those moments, but also the family communication skills to talk about those experiences, to talk about what they saw, to talk about why we don't like what they saw. Porn sites, uh, this recent study came out and said that porn sites are viewed each month more than Amazon, Netflix, and Twitter combined. Porn sites are viewed each month more than those combined. And that same study said that over 90% of the most viewed pornography involves physical or verbal abuse against women. Again, think about then what this means for both boys and girls who have that exposure. This means that their earliest kind of visual experiences with sexuality are abusive, are derogatory, often non-consensual. What we want to do is make sure that we have provided our kids with information and conversations so that we are kind of helping them create the sex template, if you will, in their head by talking about what we think sex should be, what we want sex to be for their life. How do we view sex in our relationships? What are we hoping for for their futures? The more open we can be talking about that with, their, with our kids, the more they're going to get our perspective, which is likely a different perspective than what they're going to get from this exposure. It is not our child's curiosity that is the problem. It is the accessibility to pornography that's the problem. Our kids have this thing that happens to them, and it's not just our kids, we all have it happen. Emily Nagowski calls it arousal non-concordance. And it's this idea that like, even if you don't want your body to respond to something, it still will respond. Like, for example, someone's tickling you and you want them to stop tickling you, you might still be laughing and you might be saying, no, don't do that anymore, but you might be laughing. Or we know that like um, victims of sexual assault, they can still orgasm even if they are 
non-consenting to the, the sexual act, they can still have an orgasm because that's a physiological response. And so when our kids have these feelings, when they're exposed to some of these images or videos, we want them to understand that even those sexual feelings or responses that their body is having, that is not the problem, right? That is a reaction that their body's having. And the more they know their body, understand their body, appreciate their body, know how to show love in a lot of ways, practice effective decision-making, the sexually healthier our kids are, the more equipped they are to deal with these types of situations as they arise. There's so much we can talk about at this age. I wanna share, I'll share maybe a, a couple other just things to consider and then I will open it up uh, for your questions. And if you wanna start typing them in the chat, please go ahead and do that. I'm happy to answer them here in a few minutes. When I'm talking about raising these reporters and I'm talking about answering their questions in a way that is developmentally appropriate, that really means that we have to trust that their brain is developmentally ready to hear some of this information that maybe we didn't think they were ready to hear. And I wanna give you some examples. So um, I will remember that my son, uh, I will never forget, he came home from a class one day and he came to me, it was, well, it was at night because they never seem to ask questions like when we just have all the time in the world, right? It's like somewhere when you're in public or when it's with grandmas around or it's in bed when we're trying to get them to you know, fall asleep. But my son said, mom, and I went into his room and he said, mom, all the kids at school seem to know something I don't know. And I said, okay, tell me about it. And he said, and you're going to see where this is going very quickly. And he said, in math class, they all seem to be laughing when the number 69 comes up. I don't get it. And I said, yep, that makes sense. And I said, what does your teacher do? And he said, well, sometimes my teacher laughs. And I said, yep. People are gonna laugh at that kind of for your whole life. And I said, that is something that even adults might laugh at. And I said, to be honest, I don't really get what's funny about it either. And then I said, would you like me to tell you what 69 means? And he was like, yeah. And so I told him what 69 meant. Now my son at that point had already heard about what sexual intercourse was. He already knew that there were different types of sexual behavior. So to explain what the number 69 meant or why people thought that was funny or why everybody was giggling, maybe took 20 seconds to answer the question because he already had the other information in place. That conversation would have been much bigger if I had to say, okay, well, so in order to understand this, we have to understand sex. So let's start by talking about sex. And in order to understand this again, we have to learn that there's different kinds of sex. And so I'm gonna tell you about the, can you imagine that at nine o'clock at night, that would not be the conversation that I would wanna have. But instead, what happened is that he had a question. I answered it directly. We built that relationship that he has questions and I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna tell him the truth, right? And that it's really short. That was a short answer. I answered and then I said, do you have any other questions? And he was like, no, he's like, I, don't, I still don't really get why it's funny. And I said, me either, me either. And then we moved on. Now, my daughter, my kids are very different, just like I'm sure your kids are very different. My son asks me every question. He wants to know everything. He's the kid that will say, mom, this thing came up on my phone. What does this mean? Or this kid sent me a text message. What? He will ask me that. My daughter, on the other hand, no. She's in fourth grade. She knows everything, does not need any of my information. Every time I try to offer her information, right? Uh, it's not good enough because she knows everything. You might have a kid like that too. So this was very recent uh, that she got in the car and she, this is not a joke. This is a real story from my life that she got in the, well, they all are of course, but she got in the car and she went 69. And I said, what? And she goes 69. And I said, do you know what that means? And she goes, yeah, it means sexy. And I said, no, it doesn't. It does not mean sexy. And of course she said, yes, it does. And I said, it does not mean sexy. Would you like me to tell you what it means? And she said, no. And she told me about a friend who told her and she said, my friend, so-and-so said that it means sexy. And I said, okay, well, your friend might think that's what it means, but I'm just telling you that that is actually not what it means. Would you like me to tell you? And she kind of looked at me a little bit. She was like mad, but intrigued. And knowing her, because she does not like to talk about anything at all related to sex or bodies or anything like that, I said, it has to do with sex. Would you like me to tell you? And she said, no. Okay. And that was fine. She didn't want to know in that moment. I knew we would revisit it at some point, but I was not going to trap her in that conversation. 
I had already told her that what you think it means is not what it means, that it has to do with sex, not being sexy, and that I do think she should know. I kind of ended that by saying, okay, well, I just want you to know that like, if you go around yelling that in front of your brother and his friends, uh, they are going to have something else to say about it because they know what it means and it is not that. I wanted her just to know that like, that's not what we should go around yelling at people. So it took 24 hours. And the next night she said, okay, mom, I want to know what it means. And I said, okay, but I said, I'll tell you what it means. I said, I'm always going to answer your questions, honestly. And I'm always going to give you the truth, but this is something that I don't know if your friend's parents are telling them these things yet. So I will tell you this, but I don't want you going and repeating this to all of your friends. So even your friend who told you that they think it means sexy, we just need to let it go with them. And at first she was like, well, I can't do that. I have to tell them what it means. And I said, then I don't want to talk about it yet with you. This is really something that I just want to tell you because I think you're smart enough to hear it. And I think your brain developmentally wants to know, but I don't want you repeating this to other people. So she thought about it for a little bit and kind of, again, was like, fine, tell me. So I told her now she did not know what oral sex was. She did not know what the different sexual behaviors were. She knew what intercourse was. She knew that I think there was more to it. But so that conversation with her was a little bit longer than it was with my son when we had the same topic. But it still was only like two minutes long, three minutes long, because I wasn't going to get into what I think about it, what I feel about it, all of these. I was simply going with, she's a reporter. She's going to have questions. She wants to know what it is. So I'm explaining it. Now, let me tell you, for my child who usually has zero follow-up questions, she had a lot of follow-up questions. And while I realized that the questions were hard to answer, and I'll share some of them with you, but they were hard to answer. They did make me a little uncomfortable. I also, in that moment, thought, this is exactly what she should be doing. This is exactly what she should be doing. And this is my child who I have been worried, I will be honest, that I have been worried does not know all of the things. And she won't let me talk to her about all the things. And while my son, I'm like, he is prepared for the world. We have got a sexually healthy kid there. With my daughter, I have often thought, I don't know if it's working. But in this moment, we sat there and she had follow-up after follow-up after follow-up. Again, still maybe only a seven-minute conversation in total. But the questions were so reporter-based. She said, do people really do that? <laughs> yes, they do. Like real people? Yes. She wanted to know, do you do that? Right? These are questions where you're like, okay, how do I get out of here? Right? And you want to leave. And I get it. These are the questions that as parents we dread. But there are ways to just be direct in answering the question without giving information. Because what our, our brain as adults wants to do is say, um, well, I mean, yes, no. I, uh, and we want to like talk about it. We don't need to talk about it. She wasn't asking me to talk about it. She was asking yes, no questions. Right? So for me, by the way, I talk for a living. You can only imagine how much I am the mom who like wants to run after my kids in the hall and be like, but oh, wait, there's so much more to tell you. I have to learn just to zip it. You ask me a question, I'm gonna give you the answer. They are reporters. They are trying to get the information and they are going to process it. When they are older, we can start to fill in a little bit more of like our feelings about things, our sort of values about things, more of our beliefs about it. We can ask them to think about their beliefs about it. They're going to naturally start to develop kind of their own theories of the world as they get older. But these reporters just wanna know the information. This is why when they hear things from other kids at school, they might hear a term and go, oh, okay, now I know, right? And then they go tell all of their friends what something means. And you know, just like the misinformation my daughter was given, that they are getting a lot of information that is incorrect. So you might be thinking, okay, but Heidi, now you just told your child and maybe she is going to go tell other people what it means. Yep. I am trusting that she did not. But if she did, the reality is that she was giving them the truth. She was giving them accurate, factual information. We did not talk about values around it. We did not talk about judgment around it. So she wasn't telling people whether something was good or bad or right or wrong. She just simply knows the facts, which is more than what she was given originally. This is why I want us to start to trust that when our kids ask us these questions, we can have a very direct and simple answer and let them kind of guide the conversation. One more example I'll share with you. Uh, this is about two years ago. Uh, my son and I were in the car. We were on the way to the dog park and he saw a billboard. It was off of like the major freeway by our house. And there was a billboard. It was a pro-life billboard. And it said, 
thanks mom for giving me life. Okay. And my son was like, oh my gosh, that's the stupidest billboard I've ever seen. And I said, oh, what makes you say that? And he's like, because obviously mom, you gave me life. I'm not going to take out a billboard to say thank you. Okay. His very reporter brain at the time saw something and it had just a very kind of direct response to it. Like that was a very literal interpretation. And I said, oh, okay. And I said, yeah, well, you're welcome for your life, by the way. But also, do you want me to tell you what that billboard is about? And he was like, yeah, because I think it's stupid. So I said, okay, have you ever heard of the word abortion? And he said, yes, but I don't know what it means. And I said, oh, okay. I said, that billboard is actually about abortion. And so within, again, maybe a minute, I'm able to explain what an abortion is. I'm able to explain what that pro-life billboard was and why somebody might take out a pro-life billboard because there's people who might be on that flip side of that, um, of that value or belief. Okay, so then we're like maybe a minute from the dog park and I'm thinking, good job me. I answered his question, right? He just sat there with it. And then he says, as we're very close now and I thought we had like gotten them the clear here, we're almost at the dog park and he says, how do gay people have sex? And I said, okay, well, this seems like maybe we need more than 20 seconds to answer the question, except again, I said, put on my little like thinking cap. He's a reporter. He asked a question. Let's give a reporter answer. And what I knew in the moment is that I could see the like the process that he had gone through, right? That we had just had a conversation about people having sex when they necessarily didn't want to have sex, getting pregnant when maybe they didn't want or choose pregnancy. We had just talked about these options that he had never been really kind of mindful of before. Because pr pr uh, prior to that, he had just known like what intercourse was and like how reproduction worked. He had never really thought about at that age or known about these other things that even he knew people had intercourse for more than just reproduction, but he hadn't really thought more about it. So this conversation we had about the billboard really opened his mind to that idea that there are a lot of other things related to sex. So now he's thinking about who has babies, who doesn't have babies, how does this work? Wait a second. And you could just see his little reporter brain going to those next questions. These are questions that are age appropriate for our kids to know. And the key that I cannot stress enough is that we want them to get those answers from us, from their parents. Because then we are doing the relationship building. We are doing the information sharing. And it does open the door for us to have conversations about our family values and our family beliefs as they get older. We want to take advantage of their little reporter brains now. And I keep calling them little because pretty soon they're not going to be so little anymore, right? We want to take advantage of knowing developmentally what they're ready for and really start to focus on the relationship building and the information sharing. And if you have a child who's not coming to you with these questions, right, then we want to make sure that we're taking some opportunities to plant these questions in front of them. Things like when you're watching a TV show, when you're at the store, I always give an example of like, you go to Target, right? Maybe you have no need to go down the tampon aisle, but you take your cart down the tampon aisle and you go, oh, funny that we're in this aisle. This makes me think about how I've probably never talked to you about tampons before. We should talk about that sometime. And then you move on. You don't have the lecture there in Target, but you preview, hey, we're going to have this conversation. You're sort of being like, I call it being strategically spontaneous, right? That we're thinking about ways to have these conversations that feel very non-threatening to our children, but that again, focus on the relationship building and the information sharing. This is a big age. There's so many things to talk about. I could share so many more stories. Um, I wanna make sure though, that we are talking about what matters to you, what you're going through with your kids in this age group. So if you have any questions, um, you can go ahead and type them in the chat box. If you've sent any, um, if Carrie has any questions that she's been given, not yet. All right, well, I'm gonna zip my own lips here for a second. And I'm gonna give everybody just a few seconds if you wanna type a chat um, with a question. All right, we've got a great question right off the bat. So how does a mom explain puberty to her son? So let me start by also kind of saying another common question I get related to this is if, if we have both a mom and a dad, and if we have like a daughter and a son, right, should the mom explain to the daughter and should the father explain to the son? And I always say, you explain the parent who is in the room, right? If a question comes up, whichever parent is in the room is the one who should be answering. So if my son is going to ask me a question about his body, now, as he gets older, to be honest, I know less and less about what is happening. Like I know what's happening, but I haven't experienced it. 
but I can still say, yeah, that's a really good question. Actually, I don't really understand quite how all that works. Um, we could look it up together, or maybe when your dad gets home, we can talk about that. Right now I have that option, right? Because I do have, um, a husband who would be at home and would be talking about it. Although very often, right. It is me doing the talking. He likes to just defer to the fact uh, that this is my job. Um, right. But if let's say you were the mom and you're the one who does primarily all the talking about this anyways, or that maybe there isn't a, a male in the house to be talking to a son about puberty, it can feel awkward. And what we want to do is really try to focus on the relationship building piece first. We want to build a trust. If we're talking about the question about the mom explaining to the son, we want to build the trust that this conversation is not going to be overwhelming. And so I would say that real kind of easing into it, we're going to say, Hey, I just been thinking about, or I just attended this session and gosh, it's like your, your body is just so smart and your brain is so smart. And I just, I'm sure that you know a lot of this already, but I've never really talked to you about puberty before. And I feel like we should be talking about what goes on in your body and what goes on for a girl's body, right? And you give them that preview and then you talk about it. And then if we're talking about it, and I'm not quite sure if we're explaining puberty for girls or for boys, maybe for both, I would start by just saying that puberty is a time in your life, right? Where your body goes through changes. And ultimately it's kind of when we say that your body goes from being a child to being an adult that your child body is developing into an adult body. But that's kind of first and foremost, that's the easiest explanation. Then we can say that what's happening during puberty is that your body is getting ready to do adult things like maybe having a baby when you're older, because that really is kind of what's happening here in our bodies. This is, it's, it is related to that reproduction piece. When you think about menstruation and you think about erections and while sperm is certainly a part of their life you know, before puberty, when you think about how it all works together, you think that that's an important part of thinking about it. And we don't need to get into a lot of detail about our values at that point, but you can say, I know that you're not thinking about having a baby. And so you probably don't even care, but right when you're an adult or when you're in a relationship, when you're married someday, you might be thinking about it. And so this is something that your body is doing kind of all on its own to get ready for that time. And then again, we just start with kind of the easy I say easy, but like the big things that will happen. So for girls, it's going to be their breast development and, um, and getting their periods and then certainly developing body here for boys. Usually it's, um, hormones are happening first, which is going to be emotional, but also it's going to be, you'll probably start to smell them, uh, pretty early on for boys. That smell is usually pretty strong and a sign that their body is changing, but then they'll notice things like, uh, body hair is usually a pretty first sign they'll notice things like um, their testicles and their penis are getting larger. And then they'll notice obviously things like their body is changing, their voice is changing. So we can just be kind of direct with those are the big things that are happening. And before we sign off, um, which isn't for another 10 minutes or so, but I know Carrie has a great kind of uh, collection of books that she can post for everybody. And some of those books are gonna be really helpful ways. Not that we just give these to our kids and say like, go read this and learn about puberty but they involve really helpful images, some of them, and helpful language. So that if we're struggling to come up with, like, what do I say about it? That there are some really helpful resources out there to give us the language too, so that we can be in it with our kids. Um, okay, so I have a couple other questions here. Um, oh, and Carrie posted that list. So there's a list here um, for this tween age group of some really helpful books and resources. And we can talk more about those too, if you have. Um, okay. So I have a question here about masturbating. This is such a great question because when I talk to parents of younger kids, they'll often ask me about um, what we call genital touching, which is like, oh, my five-year-old just keeps rubbing you know, herself up against things. Or you know, my six-year-old just keeps touching his penis and he can't stop. And what is that? And a lot of times when I'm talking with those parents of younger kids, I reassure them it is genital touching. We don't usually consider it masturbation until they've gone through puberty. But lo and behold, we're in that age group here tonight where I'll say, yes, this is when we might start consider uh, or considering to calling it masturbation. That usually genital touching is more of a curiosity thing. It sometimes becomes a coping mechanism or a habit. But right now that they're in this age group, it really is a little bit more of like a physiological reaction and it does feel good to touch their bodies. So in terms of talking to our kids about masturbation, um, you want to first figure out what are your thoughts about masturbation? That's one of the kind of biggest pieces of, pieces of advice I can give to any parent is really thinking about 
these things that you want to talk to your kids about, you have to first figure out what you think about it. So while their questions might catch you off guard, like about oral sex, and you can just directly answer that, you might want to now, if they haven't asked you those questions first, start to think about, what do I think about that? What would I say about that? How would I describe that? What am I going to, what am I willing to tell my kids about my own experiences? What am I willing to tell my kids about when I think these things are appropriate? And while I'm not suggesting that that needs to be a heavy part of the conversation now, it is helpful to, for you to be thinking about. So in terms of masturbation, if in your home, if in your family, masturbation is something that you kind of welcome as a way to, you know, be curious with their bodies, to understand their bodies, to get familiar with their bodies, then that's how you can frame it. You can mention it by name and talk to them about it that way. You can, um, if you see that they're starting to kind of touch themselves, you can say, hey, I know it can feel really good to touch our bodies. In our family, we prefer that you do some, you do that more privately in your bedroom or the bathroom, right? And then as they get older, they start to get more familiar with what that really means. But we can use the word masturbation with them at this age. Uh, we don't have to, if we think it's still more of that genital touching, we can call it genital touching. That's a pretty awkward word for a lot of us to use with our kids because it's not something that a lot of us are familiar with. So if the word masturbation is more familiar to you and you want to use that word directly with your kids, you can. The last thing I'll say about uh, masturbation here is that if you are not talking to your kids about it, again, they are going to start hearing about it from other places. They're going to start seeing references to it in films. They're going to hear people talking about it on the bus. And they are often not using the word masturbation, right? They're going to use more of the slang words for these things. Same with like oral sex. Most kids aren't using the words oral sex, right? They're using slang words for it. So we have to start kind of getting ourselves familiar with and prepared for addressing these things. But for us, we can use the proper names and labels for them. Um, so if that person has an another question about like, what else should we say about it or how else to bring it up? Let me know. Um, Okay, so another question is how do you talk about inappropriate images and how to be safe without scaring your child about pornography and dangerous people, things like posting pictures on social media. That's a hard one. So in terms of our own children's social media use, I get it, that can be hard because developmentally, the other thing, I mean, part of puberty, right? It's not just their bodies changing, we know that. One thing we often don't talk about with our kids are just the emotional changes that occur during puberty. And those emotional changes really impact their friendships as well. And developmentally for them at this age group, that can quite literally feel like life or death to them, right? That when their friendships are changing, when they have a friend who's mad at them, when they have a friend who isn't inviting them places, that disconnection can feel really threatening to like their survival, right? And that actually is that we can get into the science behind it and the psychology behind it uh, later or another time if we want. But that actually is very developmentally normal because as our children attach to us when they're younger, as they get older, the idea is that they are not attaching to us anymore. And they are in fact attaching to like a community, right? That at some point they'll have a community of peers and friends, uh, other people in their life, other adults that they're going to sort of attach to, right? That we attach, that they attach to us when they're younger, they separate and they find a group to attach to. They're experimenting with some of that attachment stuff at this age group. Right? They're still attached to us, but their desire to be attached to a community is very strong. So they are looking for peers approval. They are looking for connection with other people. And so if they feel like they are not getting that from somebody, that can be incredibly um, impactful and incredibly like hurtful for them. So I say that because we don't want to underestimate uh, the impact of that in their lives. And so not that this means that we should give them social media because they need developmentally to have that community. Not what I'm saying, but we can appreciate the desire to have the communal thing. We can appreciate that when they say, oh, my friends get to be on TikTok, why can't I? Okay, and like my tendency is to be like, well, here, read this research article on teens with TikTok, you know, which is not make me a cool mom, I know, right? But I can understand that what they're really saying is, I want to feel connected to what my friends are doing. And I want to feel like a part of the in-group. And I need to find a way to be attached to these people. And this feels like a way to do it. So one thing I want to just kind of mention around that social media stuff is to really not underestimate or dismiss how strong that desire can be for them. All right. But let's say that they're on social media, right? And now we're talking about what types of pictures to post. 
well, or like, don't maybe show your face in this, or, Hey, you gotta be more covered up than this, or please don't do these TikTok dances. And you can't wear this when you're doing that, or just don't post pictures of your friends. The reality is that yes, as parents, we might be worried about the big, scary, dangerous things, but what we should maybe be more worried about, if I say that appropriately, what we might be more worried about, or what's maybe more likely to happen is that they're actually going to have more interpersonal conflicts or negative interpersonal repercussions than they are likely to be exposed to some creep out there who's taking advantage of their photo. And what I mean by that is the bullies uh, that they're going to experience, the people that are going to screenshot their picture and send it around to everybody else. And those are kinds of the conversations that we can have that also feel more realistic to our kids. And that conversation about what to post, why to post it, who should view these things, those kinds of conversations about internet safety then can be our gateway into later conversations about like, yeah, there are dangerous people and I don't want you having your face out there or I don't want you using your real name and your real birth date and here's those reasons. But if that's what we go to first, we just look like the not cool, totally out of touch parent who's like scared of the internet, right? And that's not what we wanna do. In terms of not scaring our child about pornography, the first and the first thing to do is exactly what we talked about earlier tonight, and that's to talk about it, to talk about pornography before our kids end up being exposed to it and end up having something to be scared of. When we're talking about pornography initially, it's actually not something that they need to be scared of. We're saying things like, um, hey, wow, okay, in that ad, it really felt like people were not wearing a lot of clothes. What do you think about that? Or it seems like that's happening all the time. Like, I don't really like that that's how they're portraying bodies. Let's talk about it, right? And we're gonna start with those some of those conversations. And then we can start by talking about um, how that might be considered pornography. Or we can talk about how people accidentally land on these sites. And here's a question that we can ask our kids. And it doesn't feel like a good question to ask, but it's one that we can ask. We can say, when, when were you first exposed to those sexual images? Not, have you ever been exposed? If you've been exposed, because the reality is that the majority of our kids will have that exposure. And I'm not saying right now in fourth grade, but I'm saying in the next few years. So to, to be able to say, hey, when did you ever have that kind of first experience where you saw something on the internet that you, that you didn't think was appropriate? We're not normalizing that what they saw was okay. What we're doing is normalizing that it's okay for them to talk to us about it. We're trying to take away the fear and the like, the scariness of what they saw and providing that real safe home for them. What we wanna be thinking about most importantly is that our goal is to be a safe place for our kids to come and talk with us about the things that they do see or experience on the internet. So rather than lecturing them about all the scary things that can happen, if we approach it with like, when did you have that exposure? Or what do you think about this? We're normalizing the conversation around this topic so that then when we do talk about some of the scarier things, it feels like that's part of the whole conversation, not that that is the whole conversation. I hope that that makes sense. I wanna be really respectful of our time. It is eight o'clock. I know that there is um, another question here, I'm willing to stick around after we kind of formally close things. I can stick around and answer um, the, the one last question that I have here. If anyone else had a question, I can stick around for a couple other minutes. But my primary goal is that when you leave these sessions that you feel like a little bit more comfortable or confident in answering some of your kids' questions or knowing how to initiate conversations or knowing what developmentally they're ready for. And at this age group, while maybe we weren't as explicit in discussing sexual behaviors and sexuality, I hope that you realize that the best thing that we can be doing for our kids is thinking about relationship building and information sharing. That is our goal with these reporters, answering their questions of who, what, when, where, and why, answering them directly and factually, but making sure that we do that with that goal of helping them feel safe in these conversations, knowing that our relationship is important, they can trust us, and then therefore we can also build our trust with them. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Carrie, if you wanna formally close us out, then I can stick yeah. around and answer any final questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Coet, for sharing so much valuable information. I know I learned a lot, so thank you. I hope everyone found the program helpful in some way and please register for remaining sessions if you like. We have one more next week um, and that's for parents of teens in seventh through ninth grade. 
Um, please visit our website at ahml.info for future programs for both youth and adults. And this program will be recorded and may be available for a limited time on our AHML YouTube channel. So good night, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. Thanks, everybody. So I'm going to answer just that one last question that we have here, um, which is that when you're explaining what sex is or what sexual intercourse is for the first time, um, are we talking about how it works for male, female, or same sex partner, or and same sex or, or same sex partners? And that's such a great question. So I wanted to make sure that we addressed it. Most kids, when they're asking those initial questions of like, where do babies come from or how are babies made? Most kids are asking that question of like, what is that, you know, kind of traditional way of how the sperm and egg meet. And the reality is that every time a baby is made, it takes a sperm and an egg, which means that it takes a man's body and a woman's body every single time a baby is made. The way that the sperm and egg come together isn't always the same, right? But it always takes the sperm and egg. So when we're first explaining sexual intercourse to our kids, what we're really actually doing is first explaining kind of reproduction to them. And we're explaining that process of how a sperm and egg can come together. And I always tell parents that when we're talking with our young kids and we're first explaining this, that it's always important to think about what your family values and family experiences are, right? So if you are in a same sex relationship and you're thinking, okay, well, like, how do I explain that? Like, this is how some babies are made, but this baby was made differently, or maybe this is how the baby was made, but now they're in a different relationship. And so how do I explain that? You can always add that in, right? As just kind of a little bit to the conversation. And I'll just put a plug in for the session that was recorded last week for those parents of manufacturers. If you go back and watch that recording, I give a script for how to talk about how the sperm and egg come together and how to incorporate some of your family values in there. And so while you can say things like, um, you know, this is often how a sperm and egg can come together, right? But then you also have the opportunity to say things like, but in our family, guess what? That baby came to us in a very special way. And I wanna tell you a little bit about that. And it's still going to involve the sperm and egg. So we want to make sure that they understand that kind of process of what sexual intercourse is, because that is, they should still understand that right before the world. But then what we can do when they're a little bit older, and I don't say that we have to do this to them when they're like in second grade, right? If they're asking that manufacturer question, we can answer with just how the sperm and egg meet and kind of leave it at that, maybe throw in a family value or experience if needed. But then certainly, right, as they're getting older, we are explaining to them that there are different types of sexual behaviors. And that when we typically hear the word sexual intercourse, or when people typically first use the word sex, what they are often referring to is heterosexual sexual intercourse, right? So when you hear people talking about sex, kind of generally in our culture, that is typically what they're referring to. When their friends at school are going to be talking about it, that is typically what they're referring to but there are other kinds of sex. And so then you can even say that like you, when people talk about sex, you can say, sometimes we don't know what kind of sex they're talking about. There's oral sex, there's anal sex, there's right. And we can get into all of these other types of sex and we can explain why people engage in these sexual behaviors, knowing that it's not just for um, reproduction. And that's something that, again, in that script that I offer for parents of younger kids, I always, we preface like, we're not going to lecture them about how we have sex and it's not just for reproduction, but we kind of like lay the groundwork for that to be able to follow up later and say, Hey, remember how I told you what sex was? And remember how I said that, like, sometimes the baby is made, uh, that's because not all people have sexual intercourse or engage in sexual behaviors because they're trying to have a baby. It's also something that feels good, which we talked about. And again, I kind of included that in the script from last time. So those are all like precursors to a conversation for you to really engage with how it works for male, female or same sex partners. Um, and certainly I think in this age group, that is something that they are developmentally ready to know and understand. And again, if they're not hearing it from us, they will be hearing it from other people. So we probably prefer that they hear from us so that we make sure that it's factual and that we get to support it um, with kind of our like positive, our positivity and the approach that we would take to talking about those relationships. I hope that that's helpful. Um, again, thank you so much, everybody, for your time. And if you're joining us next week, we'll get into some of these conversations in even more depth. Thank you, Dr. Croat, for sticking around and answering that last question. Thank you, everyone else, for sticking around to hear the answer. We appreciate it. Appreciate everyone for attending. Thank you so much. Thanks for your questions, everyone.